So hello, good morning. What I plan to do today is, is basically talk about my own direct-to-consumer exomes and kind of ask the question from an analysis perspective, from a bioinformatics perspective, which is my background here. You know, can I get to some kind of meaningful personal interpretation uh, for myself, for an individual, can, can use exomes to find interpretation for an individual or for a family? Um, and it, on the road towards the promises of personalized genetics, are we going to see that exomes are going to play a very key and, and long-term role, or they may have a, a, more of a waypoint as we get to something more comprehensive like whole genome sequencing, or do we find that we need to wait for a lot more comprehensive phenotype and genotype associations that can make things interpretable, where right now they can still be um, quite difficult. So first I want to thank the organizers for having me come and talk about this sort of analytical journey. Um, and it really did start back at the end of 2011, 23andMe sent an email out to their customers, and I was a customer of their, I have my genotypes called on their genotype array for myself, wife and son, saying, you know, we're starting this pilot program to do exomes, and feel free to try to sign up and you'll be emailed if you get selected to be in it. And so my first inclination was this would be very interesting. I mean, I would like to look at my own narcissism um, and, you know, see what's in there as well. But I knew if I had my wife's in there as well, I could do much more meaningful analysis. She has a relatively rare autoimmune disorder called uh, juvenile idiopathic arthritis. And I thought that would be really interesting, to, especially with the whole question of genetic heritability of these things, to know if it's all in the common, um, uh, common SNPs or if something in the exome might sort of explain that story. And if I knew if I had my son in there, I could do some basic quality assurance tests with the data. And for the purposes of any of my public discussions, that's pretty much the extent in which my son's DNA gets involved. It's just purely from a QC perspective um, and looking at that. So that's kind of what I decided to do, and, and they were uh, gracious enough to include all three of my samples in their pilot. They were very clear that this is a pilot. It is not at the order of the interpretation and polish that they provide with their standard service. If you're not familiar, they do a lot of risk prediction, trait prediction, pharmacogenomics. They have their genotypes, and they're using a lot of literature to give you some very meaningful information from a consumer perspective. Um, but this is intended to be sort of a high-quality uh, deliverable that they give you. And so, um, and so that's kind of where this started off. So I'm going to break this down into three components. At first, I'm really going to dig into that question about the quality. What do we get from a direct-to-consumer exome? How does that compare to some of the clinical-grade exomes that we've seen talked about um, at this conference? Then I'm going to look at looking at my own exome and using sort of the standard analysis you would use with an exome analysis, which is generally to look at those highly penetrant, rare um, mutations that you might see in a Mendelian disease, and that's kind of been the poster child of where exomes have been extremely successful, and see what I can find for myself, and then finally um, see what I can apply in this uh, data towards seeing if uh, a, a genetic uh, explanation or looking at the genetic architecture of an autoimmune disorder with a single individual, which can be uh, potentially very daunting. So the first thing about 23andMe's uh, approach here, I think they really did a, a best effort to follow best practices, to use standard technology. Um, they're using a high seq 2000, 75 base pairs. Remember, this is sort of circa early 2012 when they started running these things. They're using a, a Agilent Sure Select Exome Capture Kit. And they're using the broad guidelines for BWAGATK variant calling. One thing to note is they are using, and I think about the order of 1,000 or so participants, um, they're calling all the genotypes in parallel across all those samples. They're trying to get to as high accuracy variant calls as possible. And what they're delivering, and they do a very good job of making sure your privacy is protected, they have it on their servers, but they give you an encrypted file that contains the BAM files, which are essentially your alignments to the exome, your variant calls produced by GATK, um, and a PDF summary report. To look at sort of breaking down the data, and this is really doing analysis on the BAM file, um, their target was ADX average depth. Their on target for the targeted exome capture was actually a little bit better than that, around 100x. Um, some people sort of say 100x is the threshold for clinical genomics uh, exomes, but you could also see that, you know, in terms of their 20x, uh, the, the percentage of that target that's covered by 20x, it's already down to around 
not as good as uh, some of those more focused exome capture kits that uh, Baylor College of Medicine, for example, has designed their probe sets around. One thing to note from the previous slide also is that there's still quite a few reads that are ca called but have extremely low read depth, you know, below 10 here. Um, and so this is a histogram of all hundred and so thousand reads and quite a few are still called with low reads depth and that would be something you would definitely not take forward into any serious analysis. So to break down some of the um, uh, QA statistics here, if I were to filter and they provided some basic filters built into the VCF, on read depth and genotype quality, and then look at the exonic regions, and this is where I can use the TRIO information. I'm finding only three Mendel errors um, that follow those basic filters, and all of those Mendel errors um, actually were essentially just systematic errors in the genotype calling. In this case, um, here's the father, mother, son. It's a perfect, you know, recessive pattern, two alleles and heterozygous in the son. And the only reason that this was called as a Mendel error is GATK called this homozygous A. The reason it did that is because both of these alleles are not the reference, and it was only set to call a single reference and a single alternate base. And so this, these are kind of systematic bioinformatic issues that can be resolved. But for the most part, you had coverage that looked like this. Here's an exon, beautiful 50, 100x depth. Uh, a variant here is called in the pileups in the forward and the reverse strands um, and about half of the perfect coverage. Essentially, when you look at data like that, you have no doubt that you're looking at you know, as close to truth as you can get with this type of technology. Um, and by the way, these plots are sort of uh, the byproduct or being created by GenoBrowse, which is what I do in my day job is build software like that. It's a, uh, it's a free tool. You can download it from our website. So in that summary report, what they're really giving you is a extremely high level view of a couple of variants of interest. In my case, it was only 14 variants that passed their sort of rare, moderate, or high impact filters. And then for each variant, they give you essentially just this dump of data and annotations. No meaningful interpretation in terms of what it might mean phenotypically. Um, so this is just information about its quality um, and its presence in some of the common annotation databases. Um, in this case, it's just a non-synonymous variant um, with relatively low uh, predicted impact. And another point on the whole quality perspective is three months after their initial report, they did give me an updated report, um, and they said, here's your new VCF file, here's your new summary file. At the top of the summary file, because these are sort of supposed to be ranked by priority, was a relatively scary frame shift insertion. Um, and it turns out that if I look deep into the data, in fact, I pull up that region in genome browse, there's nothing but a very uh, innocuous a uh, miss or a common variant there, and the frame shift insertion should show up as, you know, one of those uh, indels. And it turns out that there is, and I did some informatics on the VCF file, 8,000 of these variants that have no evidence of being in my data, and they're essentially, you know, phantom variants. And it was actually a bug in the later version of G the latest version of GATK that they used when they updated from their first version to their, you know, second release. I wrote a blog about this, and it, and it got comments back from the 23andMe team and the GATK team. And, you know, essentially, the moral of the story is simply if you're going to be doing production-level uh, analysis, you have to validate every change to your pipeline. Um, and GATK was always just moving forward at a research pace. They have a commercial partner to help stabilize their, uh, their code to be able to be used more in a production pipeline. But, you know, with validation, this kind of thing would have been caught pretty easily. So the next thing is to kind of look at my own narcissism or, you know, my own exome and see, can I, you know, is there meaningful information using sort of the rare Mendelian um, disorder type of analysis? And what I really kind of expect to see is, you know, I'm not going to have anything that has a direct phenotypic relationship that I can note, but maybe there are some risk, um, risk variants that could be potentially pathogenic in the future or that type of thing. So you use the standard filters here that... Um, one would do looking at rare variants, non-synonymous variants, loss of function variants. But when you're looking on an individual level and you don't have a phenotype of interest to compare to, it can be quite tricky to kind of break this down, right? And you still end up with quite a few variants that are sort of in this um, loss of function category or the non-synonymous category. Um, and then, you know, it is interesting to note that even with exon capture, you're getting a lot of variants that are intergenic and intronic. So one thing you can do is uh, look at regions that are not in these uh, highly homologous versions or places in the genome. You can look at genes that are only cataloged in OMIM. 
Uh, you can look for genes that have uh, haploinsufficiency predictions or other cataloged information that might classify them as higher uh, interest if you do have a missense potentially damaging variant there. And you can look at your functional predictions. And so I did that kind of work as well. Um, and I was particularly look, interested to see if I had any homozygous mutations in genes that are sort of cataloged to have known clinical attributes. And so with only having 16 of those, it was easy to pick through them. And this is homozygous and uh, hemizygous for my X chromosome. And, you know, unfortunately, most of these either can be attributed to bad calls in the software um, or with insertions and deletions in particular, it's easy to have variants that are called differently than they are called in the uh, population catalog. So there's some that are in my wife, which should not be shared if, we're both, if they truly are rare. Um, but I did have some variants of unknown significance, hemizygous variants on the X chromosome, and one of particular interest that had extremely high um, confidence in being called, it was on the forward reverse strand, it was also very rare, it was not in the uh, NHLBI 6500s, it was not in 1000 genomes, but it was in dbSNP, and dbSNP classified it as pathogenic, and from a consumer perspective, this is sort of the end of the road, unfortunately, because dbSNP does not have deep phenotypic information about why it's classified as pathogenic, right? Um, and, or even who, I mean, you have basically the lab that submitted the pathogenic status, you don't really know much more. But if you look into the function of OTC, it does have an interesting story. Um, it's part of the urea, urea cycle, and it can, it, your deficiencies there if, if are, um, uh, can be problematic early in life, potentially also later in life. Um, I'm hemizygous, so my mother's probably heterozygous. It does have to do with protein metabolism, and it is interesting that my mother has never been a big meat eater, and especially later in life, um, avoids any heavy protein very heavily. It's very hard for her to metabolize. So there is, you know, thought process going on on whether I could investigate that further, but it is very hard to get to any without sort of more phenotypic or other types of literature to know what's going on there. So I didn't come to any meaningful uh, conclusions other than to follow up on some um, you know, potential hits there and, and really wait for a lot of the literature and potentially things like ClinVar to give me uh, more, uh, more details on how to interpret some of those rare variants. Um, so in terms of looking at what to do with an exome when you have potentially complex disease, the first thing I wanted to do was follow, again, the, uh, the, the search for highly penetrant variants. Um, so give me a little, I'm going to give you a little background of juvenile idiopathic arthritis. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, not necessarily the same as rheumatoid arthritis, but it, you know, symptomatically it's very much similar. But if you are diagnosed with it before the age of 16, that classifies you as juvenile. And it was actually usually called, or, or in before 2000 or 1998, called juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. Um, they renamed it juvenile idiopathic. They're not, it's very not uh, well uh, understood, all of the uh, pathogenesis of it. But it has a relatively rare but still, you know, manageable cohort size in the United States. You see, um, you know, a rate of 8 or 150 per 100,000 individuals. And the two main subclassifications are if it's within five or eight of your joints only, the arthritis, it's in the posi-articular, um, but if it's in all of your joints, it's in polyarticular. You also generally do not have the rheumatoid factor um, biomarker uh, that you would have with adult onset arthritis. And so my wife falls under the RF negative uh, polyarticular classification. And that seems to track relatively similarly in terms of the genetics, at least as far as it's understood with uh, RA in general, in that it's um, the best estimations for RA is that it's 60% heritable. Uh, the monozygotic twin studies concordance is actually lower than that, but the estimation of its heritability still stands at 60%. And if you look at the new, and there's been a lot of GWAS type studies on RA, and the meta-analysis of all those, they, they think they have about 51% of the heritability explained doing all that combined band analysis. But, you know, that's at a population level. What can I really do with that type of information at an individual level is the question I'm going to ask. And similarly, um, a large chunk of that heritability does fall in the MHC region with the HLA genes. So the first thing I did is follow a lot of the same um, uh, steps to look at rare, uh, potentially damaging variants, um, but I wanted to have that extra filter of looking at, 
any variants inside genes that are associated or closely associated with JIA. And to do that, I actually um, used Ingenuity variant analysis. The folks at Ingenuity were gracious enough to let me run my samples through there. And with, uh, you know, as you can see, there's quite a few sort of rare variants, but only 36 that are one hop away from JIA, uh, JIA genes. They do have literature curated about which genes are involved in JIA. As I said, there's been a number of studies recently about that. So you can look through this, and I did look through this kind of one by one, um, and there's definitely some interesting stories. So for example, in this one, this is a NF kappa B1. Uh, my wife is heterozygous, but it's uh, predicted damaging, and it's in a gene that, um, in at least some mouse studies, um, a single mutation results in elevated expression of its pathway genes. Uh, and this is also in a pathway of interest. And you can see the variant is very clean. It's supported. It's right in the middle of this exon, um, supported by both alleles. So I would trust the variant call itself. And it has this suggestive pathway where it interacts with uh, um, on the order of six or seven genes that are published to be uh, directly associated with JIA. And, and those are generally coming from population studies. So it's also not a novel variant, but it is quite rare. And if you look at sort of this frequency, it's on the order of the frequency of the occurrence of the disease in the general population in general. So that's quite interesting. It doesn't occur in a homozygous state in the NHLBI cohort. It's also worth noting the NHLBI cohort is not a control data Database. They have quite extreme phenotypes there. Um, I don't think they have a particular cohort specific to autoimmune disorders, they're mostly um, other things, but there's definitely enough extreme phenotypes that one could imagine um, some sort of shared um, risk along pathways here with those seven other individuals in that cohort that share that genotype. So if you look at also some of the more specific pathways like T cell signaling, the thing that I immediately run into is, you know, here's my NF kappa um, B1 variant we we're just looking at, and the rest of these are mutations in the HLA region. The literature definitely supports that there is a large component of the heritability, and in fact, um, DR beta 1 or HLA DR beta 1 um, by itself and a couple of its exons account for almost all of the genetic heritability, according to this paper um, of RA. So. Can I just go and look at um, DR beta 1, right, and look at its variants and do anything meaningful with that? Well, with exome data, really with NGS data in general, when you're aligning to the human reference, you're aligning to one haplotype of one of the most polymorphic regions of the human genome. Um, and the uh, Genome Reference Consortium has alternative haplotypes, I think on the order of six or seven in this region. But for any given gene, and in fact, DR beta 1 is known to have a lot of pseudogenes. For any given genes, there's a lot of, uh, you know, essentially potential for reads to be aligned to all these different places. Um, and it's also not meaningful necessarily to talk about individual mutations in terms of their amino acid changes to the reference. That's not how the community has cataloged the HLA uh, alleles necessarily. Um, but you can see from the alignments here, so the hashed region is all the coverage. Notice the coverage here is like 1,000x versus the, you know, 100x average is reads that map, multi-map to multiple regions of the genome. The, the variants that do show up are showing up at different frequencies, you know, sort of half or 10% of the calls. And so it's generally a mess and you wouldn't want to trust these variants that much anyway. But if you look at how one would actually look up HLA risk in the literature, it's going to be in terms of the cataloged um, essentially the proteins that have been cataloged. And there's a lot of variants of those proteins for the 32 genes. Um, you know, if you get into the sub subtypes, there's, there's about 9,000 different variants that have been cataloged by the AM, AMG THLA nomenclature. But the, the highest level classification, if this is new to some people, for the HLA A gene, for example, an O2 classification is essentially identifying the major class of protein, and then a four-digit classification identifies a protein very specifically. So in this case, the literature does give some information about JIA risk based on HLA types. There is, for example, a predisposition for early onset JIA with the O2, HLA A. Um, and DR beta 1, O8, and O3 seem to give you um, some predisposition to the RF negative, which is my wife's particular subclassification. So it would be very interesting to see if I could get this type of HLA typing. 
Well, I saw a talk um, at a couple conferences ago by this group called Omixon. They have some um, clever uh, algorithm secret sauce for doing alignment and particularly handling insertions and deletions. So they tackled the problem of using exomes to get to HLA types, and they essentially aligned for a single gene to all of the known um, different types individually and then rank their, their probability that they have the best possible type. So for DR beta 1, for example, their best possible pair of alleles, I have two alleles, right, one from each chromosome, um, is about twice as good in its coverage in terms of how the reads align there to the next possible one. So that's, pre you know, they're pretty confident about those and they show some pretty good concordance rates with the orthogonal ways of getting HLA types. So they were gracious enough for me to essentially dump on over FASTQ files from my wife's uh, data for this region and, and do HLA typing. And unfortunately, she doesn't really fall um, into any of these uh, risks, uh, alleles for HLA. In fact, she has 24 and 03 as her classification for HLA-A, 04 and 14 for hla dr beta one and similarly. So it's, it's not a meaningful part of the story. Even though I have exome data and I was able to get to HLA types, I didn't get to um, an interesting individual um, explanation of that potential genetic um, pathogenesis. So, I pretty much did everything I could think of with the exomes. What about using the genotypes? So I have genotype data from 23andMe. They provided the raw genotypes um, to you. And this is what they're using based on the GWAS studies that are published to give you the consumer experience of logging into the website and looking at a disease risk. Um, they do have rheumatoid arthritis as a disease risk, but they do not have juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Interestingly, my wife's juvenile arthritis disease risk puts her at a relatively protective side of things. These are sort of, your odds ratios are on the protective side. Their overall pr prediction is that she is protective against RA. That's not too surprising because we expect the genetic architecture to be relatively different. But can I go and find uh, the recently published GWASs about JA and do a similar assessment? So there are two major groups that have cohort sizes large enough to try to do this in a statistically meaningful manner. Um, CCHMC, Cincinnati Children's, and the Epidemiology Unit at the UK, and then they've actually collaborated and done sort of meta-analysis across those. So I pulled up sort of their three most um, you know, accessible papers in terms of having the individual RSIDs and the odds ratios and the counts so I could create um, essentially a risk profile for my wife and of course I only have 600,000 SNPs and over the years people sort of get different SNPs in their arrays. Um, in this case, if, for example, I wanted this SNP over here. I only had this SNP about a thousand bases away. Luckily with a thousand genomes data you can do imputation and in this case have an R-square value of one which essentially means those are perfectly correlated in the population. So I can get to genotype data for the published risk alleles here. And this was exciting, actually, because, you know, in some of these cases, she's actually protective. And this is actually the odds ratios in terms of Aaron's genotype. So when she has the protective allele, it's getting flipped. But PTBN2 in knockout mice, for example, has been shown to result in elevated uh, TNF um, protein. And my wife's, um, in terms of her clinical care, was uh, not responsive to um, methotrexate, but did really well on Embryo, which is a TNF inhibitor that was in clinical trials. There's not a super lot of data about it in all contexts, but it works really well in this case. For example, it's not known whether it's healthy to use it during pregnancy. Um, so unfortunately, over the past three years, my wife's been suffering from, I don't know if this is the clinically correct term, but, you know, chronic pregnancy. Um, and so we know from talks yesterday that the, you know, causal environmental component is not the microbiome. So if uh, this is the third pregnancy in 30 years, if someone could clue me in on what's going on there, uh, it would be helpful. I appreciate it. But so I thought this would be a really interesting story, but these all sort of wash out when you do the proper statistical way of combining these with the soccer mantle hansel test. And so I did this with the UK cohort. The CCHMA um, one actually put her a little bit protective. The, um, the, the newer paper, which was specific to GA, is a, a little more high, higher risk. And all in general, you know, this is a little disappointing. I don't have anything too, um, too comprehensive or, or, I guess, a suggestive story as to the, the common variants um, leaving 
a, a story of, of why she would have J. And, you know, it might be easy to say, okay, if it's only 60% heritable, maybe my wife just didn't have a heritable form. But, in fact, she actually has two other cases of extremely rare autoimmune disorders in her nuclear family, and it doesn't lead me to believe that there is a shared um, pathogenesis, I think, that could have a genetic explanation here. And so in terms of saying, well, let's just throw really, really large cohorts at this problem. Um, in fact, you know, her subclassification is so rare that that's relatively impossible. So I think some of the interesting work people are doing, like Dr. Jared Napalm, and trying to say, well, maybe we can get to a really well-classified subphenotype inside of a family with some biomarker data and maybe understand the genetic architecture of just that family and build on that might be useful. But um, in general, um, I did not get to a lot of meaningful interpretation of, of my wife's data, but the sort of search continues and I'll be looking at the literature and the clinical phenotype genotype data as it continues to progress. But I do have to thank Peter Gregerson, Jared Napalm, they spent some time with me talking about how I would go about this and I used um, software from my own company here that I built on my day job, our SNP and Variation Suite for doing the analysis, Genome Browse for the visualization, um, Ingenuity for the variant analysis, and Omixon for doing the haplotyping and 23 me for giving me some exomes to play with. So thank you. I hadn't heard Narcissus on before, but I think it might stick. <laughs> so what's next? What are you going to, what's your next quest? Well, Epigenetics? Well, and to be honest, there's a lot of things, especially in the whole genome spectrum, that, you know, if, if those tagging SNPs for those common variants that are highly associated, and some of these have some pretty impressive odds ratios, um, especially with the ENCODE data, could be nailed down to their causal mutations in the regulatory regions. I'm going to be using that data if I at all can, so absolutely. <laughs>